So the main points that we're going to discuss today is with respect to the disease state of favorable intermediate risk prostate cancer. And the bottom line is going to be one size does not fit all. So active surveillance certainly is appropriate for some, but not for others. We'll go through some benchmarks, which will first stratify men by comorbidity, because clearly with a disease like favorable intermediate risk, the natural history can be a decade to two. So people who are not in good health would certainly be excellent candidates for active surveillance, and I think everybody would agree with that. They probably are people who should not be biopsied to begin with, or maybe even get a PSA. However, there are definitely people in whom treatment for favorable intermediate risk prostate cancer is reasonable. Those with minimal comorbidity and those who have factors that we'll discuss today in detail, and I'll mention a few now, um, that predict for more aggressive cancer than what the workup to date may have shown. Specifically, a very interesting and very simple test is PSA density. PSA density is the PSA level unconfounded, and that's important to make sure that it's not confounded by bike riding, ejaculation, recent instrumentation, infection, inflammation, divided by uh, the ultrasound or MRI defined volume. MRI is probably better because it's more accurate. A very low PSA density is reassuring that the risk of having higher grade disease, four plus three, or unfavorable pathology if you went to radical prostatectomy like extra capsular extension, seminal vesicle invasion, positive lymph nodes would be very low. The only exception is in a man with low testosterone who's hypogonadal who cannot mount a PSA response, the PSA density is unreliable. In such men, decipher or some other genomic classifier would be reasonable because there's also data that will show that supports a very, very high rate of showing that disease is not clinically significant if the decipher is very low. There are a number of other factors that we'll go through, such as whether the disease is visible on MRI and whether the targeted biopsy actually disclosed that, the percent grade four, a person's BMI, their age, the PSA velocity in past years. We'll also talk about whether the disease is palpable or not. And these factors I'll talk about today don't only apply to Gleason 3 plus 4, but actually also apply to Gleason 6, which people often talk about as not needing treatment at all. But in fact, I'll give an example would be a man who has a PSA of 9 and a, a normal-sized gland of 30 has a PSA density of 0.3. And suppose that they had a family history of prostate cancer and they carry a mutation like BRCA2. And to boot, if they were African American, I'm just giving you things to pile on that could actually, you know, say this is not somebody we want to observe, especially if they're young. Um, I think the other thing too, as I'll discuss, is the future research in this area, which gets into, as we heard this morning, machine-based learning and its ability to predict adverse pathology at prostatectomy in men with otherwise favorable indices. Multimodal modeling, which has been done by multiple people, basically taking several factors and putting them into a model, similar to machine-based learning, just using a different methodology. Also, we'll talk about whether or not active surveillance protocols in terms of intensity, what do you do, how often do you follow, can be modified uh, based on the research I just mentioned. So if someone's at very low risk of having adverse pathology, do you really need to biopsy them every year and get an MRI? Whereas if they're at high risk for adverse pathology, should you be reevaluating them in three months or six months? Finally, we'll talk about um, modifiable risk factors, diet, exercise, and their potential impact on delaying people from going from you know, surveillance to treatment. So those are the main points that we'll discuss today.